Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Bible Study. Um, lost track of the number of weeks now that we've been online, but it's been a joy. Today is September 16th, 2020, just two days from my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. I think they're on every Wednesday night. And uh, so just a, uh, just a quick word there to my mom, dad, both. Mom, I hope you have a wonderful birthday. Many of you are aware we've been studying the book of Romans um, in our Wednesday night Bible study, a 15, I think a 15, less than 15 week uh, course of study that we're doing. And uh, But I wanted to back up for a moment this evening um, and just remind you about kind of how I do studying and what on Wednesday night would have shared with everybody about the way we go about this and a great way to dig deeper that's not real complicated. And so um, what I want to do here, let me bring up my PowerPoint is just if you go to our website, I've mentioned on regular basis that I've got some documents there. Now, this is the simplest uh, one really that that kind of gives you an idea of how we're studying. But like tonight's going to be Romans 2, 17 through 320 and uh, the, this on the, on the website, if you download this, I think there's a PDF and a Word document, um, it's just blank. And so you can fill in the blanks here. And then what you do is you read the text. So that's our homework uh, is to read the text. And then you would use this and write down your observations that, that you observe without doing anything. You just read and and observe. Then interpretation, you go back to the text and pick, uh, use tools, uh, commentaries. Many, many of you probably have study Bible where you have commentary right in the columns or at the bottom of the page or something. And um, I use some websites also, biblehub.com I use a lot to study language, context, history, the whole works to help with interpretation. Because our goal is to get to what the original author writer meant when they first wrote those words, right? And then this is um, uh, the goal, which is application. So how does what I've observed, what I've learned from interpretation, how does it apply to my life, to the life of the church, to whatever, you know, what's the application? And so um, just encourage you to go check that out. This is also on there. This is just a further explanation of each of those things, the three steps of Bible study, observation, interpretation, application. Um, and then you can read the little paragraph in each that helps you to understand a little bit about what each is. Um, I like the, uh, what it says here about application. Finally, we'll discover what the scripture means to us. Um, the Bible was not given to fulfill our curiosity, but to transform our lives. Um, earlier, I was about to say my favorite part of this is application because it's about transformation of our lives. And um, so you can pick that up on the website, also friendshipwesley.com. Uh, both of those, the reading schedule that we're doing each week, and, uh, and follow along with us. Hey, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you tonight. Um, thank you for your word, the power of your word that is living, sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting to the marrow of the bone. Father, speak into the recesses of our lives, those places, the innermost thoughts and parts of our lives. Father, we want your spirit to move there as we walk through your word and learn more what it means to be uh, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. To, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are love. We thank you that you are merciful. We thank you that you are truth. You're truthful. And tonight in Romans, Father, the Apostle Paul, you inspired him to speak clearly about our depravity, our inability to save ourselves. So, Father, we're grateful tonight that you have saved us through your precious Son, Jesus. Now teach us, Father. Be our teacher tonight, we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So let me go back to our PowerPoint um, and bring up the next 
slide Romans. Um, you've become familiar with that each and every week. Um, I mentioned that already, that we're in Romans, so grab your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 2. Um, uh, last week, we went through chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, this week, fairly large portion of text um, all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. I think I have that on here as well. Yeah, faith works, the dark side of religion. Remember, I wanted you to remember some things. Um, Paul is laying down his case for the depravity of humanity, our inability to save ourselves, our sinfulness, our brokenness. And, uh, and so if you were like the dark side of religion, one of the things Paul's going to bring in is the inability of religion. Where the word law is used, and he's going to speak about the Jews, um, but the inability of the law um, to save us. Um, it can convict us of sin, um, which I, right now saying that I remember I forgot to point my notes. Hopefully when we get there, I'll remember to point that out, that it's not that the law is no good. It's just that it's not able to save us, but it is able to convict us of sin. So this large portion of text, it, it may have, if you read it this week, been a bit... Um, ominous for you to, I mean, when you looked at it, thought, how are we going to study all of that in a half an hour? Um, in the online version, in-house here, we spend nearly, usually about an hour. Um, of course, we uh, were a lot freer in our commentary, and the the um, crowd interacts with uh, with me as well, shares what they're learning from the text. So, but in this half an hour of time, it'd be very hard. But what, what I have done with this, and really commentaries do with this section as well, is break it down into divisions, larger chunks, and get the themes from each of those. As a matter of fact, one commentary that I like, um, Matthew Henry's commentary. I went to that. I've used my own words, but the Matthew Henry commentary, um, if you're familiar with them at all, it really does that by and large in all of its stuff. It takes large portions of texts and gives um, line by line commentary, um, usually uh, themes of that portion of text, not verse by verse of every word or every detail. So taking a look at that, I came up with some separations here. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 24, Jews and hypocrisy. Chapter 2, 25 through 29, outward versus inward transformation. Chapter 3, 1 through 8, our righteousness proves our need for God's righteousness, and he is faithful. And we all said amen, right? And then chapter 3, 9 through 20, insufficiency of the law. I put quotes, hopefully by the time we're done with this, we'll understand a little bit better what Paul meant by the law. But uh, let, me give a, let me give a reading of this text uh, for you, beginning at chapter 2, verse 17, reading through chapter 3, verse 20. Um, in the online version, anyway, every week, I've been just been reading the entire text so we can mm -hmm. absorb it and then go back and uh, tonight, it's not going to be a, a verse by verse, but a division by division. So let me read it for you. Beginning verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written codes and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. 
A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. What advantage then is there being in a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human be a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak, prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's faithfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And you're thinking what I'm thinking, which is, wow, there's a lot in that, that portion of scripture, that text um to to process and then in some of what i was reading i tried to give emphasis to the places where no one's righteous not even one their throats are open graves their tongues practice deceit remember once again i told you about this that paul is is building a foundation for us to understand the depravity of humanity how messed up we are and uh, get that. I just think that's one of those things that humanity in common does not get. Um, as we try to figure out who, you know, common culture tries to figure out who God is. Um, we need to understand better who we are. <laughs> um, because it misinterpret like God's wrath that we talked about last week. We are deserving of God's wrath. And if you understood our sinfulness and our depravity, right, it would be easier to uh to understand that remember as well that paul was writing i think in week one we talked about this paul was writing mainly to gentiles in this letter to the romans but also to a group of jews in this text that we have tonight he brings up the jew um, um i think in illustration but also possibly addressing that small group of jews that was included in this this letter and so um, once again, the whole deal here is Paul's laying down the, in this most of this text the inability for religion to uh, to save us. So backing up to verses 17 through 24, I'm not going to read all of that for you. Um, in the first, um, well, I'll reread some things, but remember we're taking this in a lump sum here. Uh, but in verse 17, um, he says, "Now you, if you call yourself a Jew." Um, and I think one of the things that Paul's saying here is, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people. They're the ones that should know better, uh, the ones who have the law. Um, and he concluded by saying the law brings a consciousness to sin. Um, but and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just sharing thoughts here because I think one of the 
things Paul will say. I'm not quoting some commentary. But uh, the, if the law brings conviction consciousness about sin, then the Jews should have known better, right? Because they had access to the law above and beyond all other um, peoples. So if you go to verse 21, he, Paul says, Are you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? He's speaking to the Jew. There's a lot of scholars who believe that he's mainly speaking to the, the, uh, the scholarly Jews, the upper echelon, the uh, Pharisees, if you will, the, the religious leaders, um, Jews. Um, we, we don't, I don't think we have clarity on that in the text. Uh, he uses the word Jew, but I think we could probably keep that in mind a little bit. But uh, so, he, so he said, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? And you can read, he's got these, you say this, but then you do this. And uh, it, it made me think, you, these people in this text have a, a problem that I would call a do as I say, not as I do problem, right? You, you, as I read through it the first time, you were probably thinking that too. Um, and, and you've heard that, right? That it's, e I think it's easy common to our human nature to, to live sometimes in a do as I say, not as I do kind of uh, life. And uh, I think the most powerful verse in this text is that, that uh, verse 24, as it is written, because he's talking about, in verse 23, he says, you who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? So the, those opposites, right? Hypocrisy, we'd call it. And then in verse 24, he says, as it's written, God's name is blaspheme, blaspheme from um, uh, uh, among the Gentiles because of you. Whew. And I, it's, I just think that one's come in some ways the easiest for me to understand and to get. Um, you know, it wasn't new. Uh, it wasn't a new idea in the Bible when Paul brings it up here in Romans that the Jews, that God anyway thought that the Jews had blasphemed the name of the Lord among the Gentiles. Matter of fact, uh, let me go back to our PowerPoint. I, uh, I found a text in particular from the Old Testament. Matter of fact, um, this quote here in uh, verse 24 is from uh, a couple of different texts in the Old Testament, scriptures in the Old Testament, Isaiah 52, 5, and then Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Um, so uh, let me move myself here so I can see the words. And then, so listen to this, therefore say the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned, among the nations where you have gone. Ooh, so, so it's not a new idea uh, that Paul brings up to the Jews he's uh, uh, addressing. By the way, I think when he addresses the Jews, there's application for us as believers today, as God's people today. We'll get to that uh, in, in a moment. But if you know, if you, if you do your, one of the impactful things about this text in the Old Testament to me, Ezekiel was writing, uh, as one among, uh, the Jews who'd been taken captive in Babylon. The Babylonians had overrun, um, uh, the Jews and brought them back to, uh, Babylonia as captives and, uh, and so the, my thought was here, God, God is um, taken back. God is pointing out that they're being a bad witness. But look at the context in a bad situation. I don't know how many Jews probably could have said to God at the time, yeah, but, but uh, Jehovah, but Father, look, um, we're in this bad circumstance and this bad stuff's going on. How do you expect us to be a good witness to the world? Um, and I think one of the messages here is, whether it's good times or bad times, bad times like we're going through whatever else, um, as God's people, um, God wants us to be his hope in the world, his light, we'll get to that in just a moment, his um, salt in the world, and, and um, we should pray and, uh, and want to be, because I think that's what Paul is saying, God's name is blasphemy from among the uh, Gentiles. But let's look here for a minute. I want to understand, you know, what is, you've probably heard that term to blaspheme, but I don't know uh, if we've actually, you know, do we get that word? And so um, it, 
the first thing I did is look at translations. Those of you usually with me on Wednesday night know that I do that a lot. And um, your more literal translations all use the word blaspheme. Um, it, even some of the paraphrases use the word blaspheme. I found a couple here, uh, Contemporary English Version and the Good News Translation that don't. They try to spell it out, if you will, this word blaspheme. So here's the verse says, it is just as the scripture tell us, you have made foreigners say insulting things about God. Remember, we're trying to understand that word blaspheme. The scripture says, because of you Jews, the Gentiles speak evil of God. So these two paraphrases trying to describe the word to blaspheme, because I've kind of alluded that it more or less meant, means to me that text that they were not being good witnesses. They were causing the Gentiles to look unfavorably. Um, so let's take a look at what that word blaspheme means in Greek. You know, I always go there after look at translations. Hey, by the way, if you got a little, you noticed a little edit there, something happened with my computer um, that caused a problem. So we cut and uh, now I'm editing in my final thoughts um, with you after the, you know, so we were on that idea of being, being witnesses. But uh, that, that Greek word for um, blaspheme, um, it, the, when you look at it, you, you see why um, most of the translations, even paraphrases, use that word blaspheme, because it's one of those words, again, connected to a word we're familiar with. I wouldn't know how to pronounce it, but you can see clearly the word blaspheme there, and here's what it says properly. Refusing to acknowledge good, worthy of respect, veneration, hence to blaspheme, which, now let's just listen to this, reverses moral values. So the effect that this was having on the Gentiles was to undo the potential that God could have with them to create in them um, values. And, uh, and so um, it made me, you know, I, it made me move pretty quick to applications. So how do we apply this then, you know, today? How, do, how can we ruin our witness? And I, I think it's the same that we see in the text, because what you see in that text is hypocrisy, right? They were, they were being hypocrites. They were saying uh, one thing but doing another. So, so it, as believers, as Christians, hypocrisy um, and then not living the Christian life. I, you know, not living, um, you know, the, I think sometimes we've arrived at this place where at least uh, we believers in the church kind of think that the world and the church, we all look alike. Um, I don't think the world looks at it that way. I think people outside the church, if someone says they know God, um, and where we get scared is, is, well, then they expect me to be perfect. I, I have not found that. They just expect us to be honest and transparent, and they do expect us to have moral values. And so um, the not living the Christian life. You know, Jesus was concerned about our witness big time and about how we um, lived before uh, the world. Look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, your Christian life, your love for God, and glorify your Father in heaven. So this isn't, we get all wrapped up about what I look like. It's about what God looks like. Are we living a life that brings him glory, um, that, that honors him uh, before our friends and family and loved ones um, who need Jesus, who need, need God? So just uh, real quick switching subjects here for um, a moment. I'm looking at... Um, you know, those, those verses again, because really here, um, in some ways, we're, um, we're dealing with the law, right? So in verses 9, if you were convinced that you're a guide for the blind, previously said to that, um, uh, verse 17, if you rely on the law and boast in God, right? 
um, if you know his will and approve of what it is, period, because you're instructed by the law. The law is brought up a bunch here. Verse 23, you, you who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Um, uh, verse 25, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have, and I just wanted to make sure that we understand what's being meant by the law here. Um, and when we speak biblically about the law, you have the Mosaic law, um, and that would be Moses, the laws that Moses received, right? And um, they would have considered that to be the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, is referred to as the Torah. So that's called the um, Mosaic Law, uh, all the rules and regulations that are in there. There was uh, what I call the Pharisaical Law, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Um, they added to the Mosaic Law other laws to be able to fulfill the Moses Law. So they had all of these other regulations and everything that um, that they added to it. Um, you know, when Paul's saying this, I think he's specifically speaking into the Mosaic Law, the one the Jews would have um, easily been legalistic about and wanted to follow rigidly. So, so as to, um, I think, in some ways, show that they had God or to prove that they have had God. So it, it makes us like, what's the application now? Because um, the, you know, uh, probably most of us listening, I don't know the Mosaic Law by heart. Um, maybe you do the Ten Commandments. We should, right? But, um, you know, what's the application now? And I think it, the application is that, that religion itself can't save us because these people, you know, Paul is saying, you guys know the law, you should, and you could easily obey the law, but yet you go around breaking the law. And that's why I said this is really a lot about the insufficiency of the law. But our actions, when we try to live out religion, when we, we do it, um, um, I was talking to somebody recently, um, and I know there's different ideas about baptism, but we Wesleyans, um, we make it clear that even baptism is not what saves you. So um, if you haven't received Christ in your heart, matter of fact, you, we believe that you can't, you don't, you shouldn't have adult believers baptism until you have received Christ. And it's a symbol, it's a testimony to the fact that you have received Christ. We believe that it's spiritual. Um, we believe that it's a sacrament, but we don't believe that the act itself is what saves you. So, you know, I recently explained that to somebody that I think was kind of fully convinced that the one thing they needed to do to be saved was to be baptized. Um, and, uh, and, and as I explained that to be saved, we, we repent of our sin and receive Christ's personal Savior. It opened up a whole new world of understanding for them. So it would be easy to practice our religious works, you know, um, communion, um, or any of the th going to church, acting a certain way, um, any of those things. I think church is essential. I think it's important. I think um, when we know Christ, it's the fruit of a relationship. But if we're trying to do it first, if, if to, to get to God or whatever, um, we only get to God through Jesus. Um, it's, it's clear in the scripture, and Paul is showing them the difference between the outward and the inward. We're going to see that in verses 25 through uh, 29. But the, I, you know, I thought to myself, there is a way a Christian acts. I call it the Christian life. Um, but the internal thing has to happen before the external stuff really matters and makes, makes a difference. So verses 25 through 29, once again, I started to read this a little bit. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but circum uh, verse 25, circumcision has little value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you become as though you had not been circumcised. Um, and then um, down in verse 28, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit. And that's not to say that circumcision wasn't a particular thing to the Jews, a physical act. It, it, it was, but Paul's making it clear that, that this new understanding of God's good news was that this was an, a thing that happened in the heart, 
Matter of fact, I'd call it that. It's a matter of the heart. Um, you know, and I, I got to think, you know, so many people want to know why there are so many Christians who don't act like Christians, you know. Um, I'll never forget, I'll try to make this story short, but I was doing a series on Wednesday night on Islam, and uh, through a series of events, two Muslim men, an older one and a younger one, showed up at our Wednesday night Bible study, um, ended up a beautiful, wonderful time of illustration and and but right at the start we were trying to figure out who's going to ask the first question they're muslims we're christians it was during a time of world tension with islam and and uh, and so with radical islam and on so there were there was this tension about what do we say what do we ask and so they were like you ask us a question and i want to be respectful i was like no you ask the question you know and i finally convinced them and the first question they asked is, uh, and they were both uh, immigrants, um, and they said, you know, they were surprised that they'd heard about America being Christian, that when they got here, so many Christians really didn't live out their faith, and they wanted to know from me why. <laughs> um, well, the, the answer that I gave them, I said, you know, the Bible says it's straight and narrow path you enter in, just because people say they're Christian doesn't mean that they're the really cool thing is they said, hey, the Quran says the same thing, and there's lots of Muslims who say they are, and they, they don't. They don't practice it. So it sounds like something kind of common to human nature to want to act out something, but to not be since, you know, really sincere about it. And, uh, but in this uh, context here, um, what it made me think was, is it's really easy to try to do stuff in the outward. I think it's why we tend to do it to do the outward acts, to act, to try to act like a decent person, to try to go to church, to, to be baptized, to do all those things. You can do all those things and still not have had the internal transformation of, of God in your life. And so the, there's many, many people who are trying to act like Christians, but there hasn't been the internal work, uh, a change of, of heart. Um, and the, this text really made me uh, think about that. And, and then I, I didn't want to pass this by without saying, uh, you explain a little bit about that internal change, because an internal change happens when we realize our lostness. Uh, I think that's a huge part of it. And why this portion of Romans is so important where Paul's explaining to us our depravity, right? And so we have to understand our lostness, our depravedness, um, and then God's grace and forgiveness and mercy. Um, and people who experience that internal change, I think, realize that we live for an audience of one, that we're, we're living for, for God, right? And that's the most important thing in your life. Um, now, moving on, uh, on to chapter three. Um, I've read this to you, so really, I, I, I pick up at uh, verse three. What if some were unfaithful? And of course, he's talking about the Jew here, what, right? What advantage then is there in being a Jew? What value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. What, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness, verse three, nullify God's faithfulness? And, uh, you know, I made me think some, some of the uh, uh, people must have been saying, hey, look at the Jew. He isn't living for God. So all Jews are um, unfaithful, which means that God must not be faithful. And, uh, and Paul's responding to this and saying, first of all, God is always faithful. Um, he, he's always faithful. Verse 4, not at all. God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written. I mean, he said, God is always faithful. Um, our unfaithfulness or faithfulness, God's faithfulness is independent of our um, faithfulness or uh, unfaithfulness. And, and you know what? If that accusation, if people were kind of making a, hey, there's, look, there's this Jew or these Jews and they're not acting the way they're supposed to. So all Jews are that way. It made me think a little bit about what I've always known about ministry. Um, I don't hear it much anymore, but I used to hear jokes about preacher's kids, right? And, um, and the, um, the thinking was that preacher's kids, by and large, are um, crazy kids. They, they do bad stuff. They, they just are wild, you know? And um, you know what the truth is? The truth is that, by and large, pastor's kids 
and I'm a little behind on recent research, but pastor's kids by and large are as good as, or um, let me say it this way, they're very um, uh, successful people, and by and large, um, they're very good moral people. But what is it that happens? Um, and it's generally with those that are in the public eye, right? So uh, a pastor's kid does do bad, and it really kind of makes the whole thing look bad, right? Um, could be true in your family setting or whatever, too, that, that one person in your family um, being a certain way makes the whole thing look a certain way, and we do that as humans. So um, I love this text because basically say it doesn't work that way. Um, it's really not. This one, this unfaithfulness over here doesn't make everybody unfaithful, and God is always faithful, um, despite our unfaithfulness here. So um, I think we just get a best up view of how things work, right? I've said that about lost perspective and all. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the things that this text is saying is, is that our unfaithfulness actually proves our need for God's faithfulness and his forgiveness, right? So then Paul keeps going with this thinking because my guess is, is that people would say, well, if me being unfaithful shows God's faithfulness more, then why wouldn't I just be unfaithful more? <laughs> it's, right? Because he said, if I, verse five, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust and bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If it were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And it reminds me back when I was in uh, uh, Bible school, undergraduate work, and, we, and I first learned about the movements or um, uh, thinking in the early church way back. And I remember two in particular that that uh, still amazed me to this day. But early on in Christian belief, there were some groups that kind of separated themselves. They weren't main thinking or theology or whatever. And, uh, and it was all on the idea of sin. And one of them was the, they literally believed that if you beat yourself, you could beat the sin out of you. So they, they would mutilate themselves and beat themselves. And then the other that what Paul says here reminds me of is if you sin, um, and sin more, just indulge in sin, that somehow then, uh, because you can't fight it. Um, so why fight it? So indulge in sin, and that'll make it go away. That'll make it be better. That'll make God look better in his. Um, and, and Paul's kind of addressing that here, right? Um, and so, um, you know, Paul's, once again, that um, all of this is saying is that we're depraved and we're, we're in need of God's help to be saved and forgive us. We can't, we can't uh, do it uh, on our own. And Paul says, what, verse nine, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all on the pow under the power of sin. And it reminded me of what's coming up now in the same chapter, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So then Paul makes this list and the rest of this chapter about our depravity that I read to you already, incredible chapter. And then I just came down to what's the point? Uh, the point here is, listen to me, we cannot save ourselves. And it reminded me of another Romans text. Um, we can't save ourselves. <clears throat> For the wages of sin is death. Let me move myself out of the way here. For the wages of sin is death. We're depraved. We all have sinned, Romans 3, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are, we just can't do it ourselves. We're in need of Jesus. And that's where our religion, our relationship to God all begins in relationship to acknowledging that we are depraved, we are sinful, and we are in need of Jesus to save us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your word. And thank you for, Father, this, these final moment, moments have reminded us that we can't save ourselves. And we were in need of a, of a marvelous, forgiving, 
plan filled with mercy and grace, and you did that through your son Jesus, his death on the cross, the shed blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we're grateful tonight. Help us to live out of that internal change in our heart that would cause a lifestyle that is pleasing to you and gives witness to this world that you love them and you want to be in relationship with them too. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, I will see you next week. God bless.